In ruling after ruling, the conservatives on this court have worked to turn back the clock on the rights of disenfranchised citizens in this country. Let's go down the list from abortion rights to voting rights to the right uh, to a fair and affordable education to the right to openly express your sexual orientation, even gender identity. This court has made its central mission to undo progress wherever it sees it. And we're going to talk about all of those decisions throughout this hour. But I want to start tonight with the big picture. How does America deal with a reactionary core dead set on turning back the clock? And what, if anything, can be done to stop it? Uh, joining us now is Melissa Murray, NYU law professor and co-host of the Strict Scrutiny podcast. She's also an MSNBC contributor. Uh, also with us is Mark Joseph Stern, senior writer at Slate, covering the courts and law. So, uh, Melissa, I'll start with you. I mean, just kind of the, the big picture takeaway of what we saw unfold today. Um, people on the surface may think of these cases being very different uh, on the issues that they tackled, even if they are hypothetical, as we said with Chris there. But there is a connective tissue between all of them, as I was just kind of outlining there. Do, do you see that as well, that there is a common theme between all of these cases? I think there's a common theme between the cases we saw this term and the cases we saw last term, especially Dobbs. Basically, we are seeing the court roll back the protections that make it possible and indeed facilitate the prospect of a multiracial, multiethnic democracy, education, reproductive rights, financial security, all of these things that we need in order to have a democracy that is inclusive and includes everyone. And that seems to be the thing the court is railing against. And to be very clear, we had a barn burner of a term last year, and typically right. the rhythms <laughs> of the Supreme Court are such that one, one, yeah. Yeah, when you have a big one, you take a breather. Right. But no, they had a barn burner of a term this year. It looks like they're shaping up to have a barn burner of a term next year. And the question I think the American people has to ask at this point is, how many barns are there left to burn, or is this court just intent on burning it all down? Yeah, and to that point, I mean, this is, uh, Mark, the 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 Roberts court, right? So I guess my question to you is, is the legacy of the Roberts court now going to be about undoing the progress that has been made throughout the 21st century? That will absolutely be a huge part of John Roberts' legacy, that he rolled back not only voting rights in Shelby County v. Holder, uh, but affirmative action. And the very notion that diversity is a laudable and compelling goal that the government uh, can pursue through race conscious measures and now through the 303 creative decision that gay and lesbian Americans have a right to equal access in the marketplace. Um, all of those principles have now been bulldozed uh, in an extraordinarily short period of time. And I, I think that in addition to rolling back the clock, John Roberts is reasserting himself and his court as the chief decision maker in this country. You know, the Supreme Court is very much the number one policy-making body of the nation. And the Chief Justice, through these decisions, is reminding us, you know, Congress can pass whatever laws it likes, the president can roll out whatever programs he wants, the states can experiment, but at the end of the day, we will be the ones to decide what you can do. We will be the ones to say the meaning of the Constitution and to overthrow any contrary ideas that you try to implement in the name of democracy. And I think that is a frightening message that the chief could not have sent louder or clearer this term. I want to ask you specifically about the 303 case, if I can, and, and the free speech argument that was made. And I understand that, you know, that applies to individuals. But then when you get to the position of a business, how does a business have a free speech uh, right, so to speak? Well, that's a terrific question, Eamon. Justice Gorsuch today spoke in this opinion as though the prospect of an anti-discrimination law that requires anyone doing business in the public sphere is essentially akin to requiring them to adopt the state's message right. of anti-discrimination. But that's not really the case. It's a she bit can, of a stretch, yeah. <laughs> well, Lori Smith, if she were actually making websites for individuals, which is still an open question, uh, she could simply have her evangelical beliefs and she could talk about them and she could espouse them as she wanted to. But the point that Colorado makes is when you decide to enter the public marketplace exactly. and provide services, you must do it for everyone who seeks those services without fear or favor for any particular group. And the court today said that, no, that's basically anti-discrimination law is the state making you adopt an anti-discrimination message. And so that should be chilling to anyone in the United States who's from a group that historically 
has been disenfranchised, has been underrepresented, has been discriminated against, because it means that regardless of these anti-discrimination protections, which exist primarily on the state level, there's not necessarily broad protections for sexual orientation on the federal level. All of these state level laws are now in question because simply individuals can say, this violates my right to free speech. It is a compelled message that the state is making me adopt. And the court has essentially blessed that. Uh, Mark, you know, it, these justices, when they were again going through the confirmation process, talked about how s there is precedence and so many of these cases are settled law and they've totally upended a lot of that, obviously, with perhaps the biggest one being Roe versus Wade. But how dangerous, if at all, are the precedents being set by these cases? I mean, what implications do they have for other rights, as Melissa was just talking to? I mean, it, thinking about not just gay rights, but other minority rights now, do you, you could get somebody who says it is their religious belief not to provide services, uh, you know, because somebody is involved in an interracial marriage or somebody is Muslim or Jewish. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's no limiting principle in Justice Gorsuch's opinion for the court that restricts the scope of this decision to LGBTQ people. Um, it, it seems that it applies across the board to all kind of protected traits. And so one question Justice Sotomayor asked is the, the famous case, Heart of Atlanta Motel, in the 60s, when a motel argued that it had uh, a right not to serve uh, black people, uh, would that case come out differently if the hotel had said, well, we feel that allowing black people to stay in our rooms is an expression of support for their identities and their lives. And I think that's very much an open question. So, you know, we focus on these kind of edge cases, the florist, the baker, whatever. Um, but this decision pushes way past that into the realm of all manner of public accommodation laws, as Justice Sotomayor points out, you know, expressive conduct is everywhere once you start to look for it. Uh, the very act of serving a customer can be expressive, even if you aren't creating anything for them. And so I do think that interracial couples, uh, religious minorities, women, all kinds of people who face discrimination have to wonder now, have to second guess, you know, if I seek services from this business, is there a chance they'll say, sorry, but my free speech rights uh, allow me to discriminate against you. And as Justice Sotomayor says, that itself, the fact that the court has issued this decree, stamps a badge of inferiority on us, on all minorities who will face um, the, the tragedy of this decision. And again, what a difference five years makes that just a few years ago, this court was uh, expanding same-sex marriage rights to the entire country, uh, refused to take the step that it took today in Masterpiece Cake Shop. This is the inevitable result of Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett joining this court. Um, and this is only the beginning of this new yeah. line of precedent. We will see how far it develops, but this is really the dawn of a new era in First Amendment law. Did you want to say something uh, in response? Well, Mark said something that's really interesting here, and it goes to this question of, like, what is expressive conduct? Ultimately, in this opinion, expressive conduct is whatever Neil Gorsuch and five of his colleagues right. thinks is expressive. And that's another theme that you see in the student loan cases as well. There, the court says, where there is an issue of major salience, a major question, so to speak, it is not up to Congress to simply delegate that authority to an administrative agency to make the decision that they're going to act on these major questions. Congress must specifically delegate authority to address that particular question here, student loan relief, to the administrative agency. But the question of what is a major question is ultimately a question that can only be answered by this court. So in this decision and in 303 Creative, the person that's won here is this institution, the court that gets to say what is speech, what is a major question, and what is the extent of their impact on our lives. Yeah, and I was going to say to Mark's point, uh, just as a final uh, summary here, it, at the end of the day, it seems like the Supreme Court is legislating these issues. I mean, that you had the affirmative action case brought by billionaires. You had the uh, student loan forgiveness case not brought forward by students. And in both cases, the Supreme Court is making a decision that affects millions. Uh, Melissa Murray, thank you so much. Mark Joseph Stern, thank you as well. Greatly appreciate your insights and your analysis.